In the name of God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. It has always struck me as strange the way the first few weeks of Advent begin with apocryphal warnings, followed by two weeks with John the Baptist before we get to the fourth week when we finally enter the Christmas story with Mary. That is, it seems strange until I remembered there's a compelling and important reason for this looking back. Diana Butler Bass wrote about this time in her recent The Cottage Post. She talks about a muted sense of hope and expectation for the church during this season. She goes on, these are the four weeks that the Christian tradition dedicates to God's vision of justice to the outcast and oppressed, rather than to the ringing of bells, Christmas trees, and Christmas carols. The word Abbot, and we've heard this before, comes from the Latin word for coming. It is four weeks of preparation, four weeks of being alert, four weeks of being awake, being present, being prepared for what is to come. We look for the coming of Jesus at the end of time. We wait and look for the coming of Jesus as a baby, the incarnation, God come to live among us. And we look for the coming of Jesus into our hearts, into our lives in the here and now, bringing light and hope and love into our darkness. This week and next, John the Baptist comes striding onto the stage. And this week we hear him shout out, prepare the way. While next week, all of those who gather around him are called a brood of vipers. Hadrick Otuma, in his commentary on today's gospel reading from Luke, points out the highly political nature of Luke's gospel. The reading begins by placing us squarely into a particular time and place in history, naming for us Emperor Tiberius, Pontius Pilate, Herod and his brother Philip, along with the high priest Annas and Caiaphas. All the key protagonists of the story named and introduced in this third chapter of Luke's Gospel. Otuma tells us Luke's text drops us into actual events, describing in detail the political landscape of the time and the complicated dynamics of conflict in the politics of the day. In it, we find all the push and pull of local governing authorities, which are really only puppets of Rome. All of them gathering and claiming their own piece of the pie. And all those familiar names dip us into their time and story that they tell. And we, we are called to listen, to let their stories and their time speak to us and our stories and our time and our particular circumstances. We can easily miss the point of the stories unless we realize that what was is now and what will be is connected to us, to our time and to our circumstances. There's something very powerful and intrusive about John as he comes out of the wilderness. And I imagine him coming out, waving his arms and shouting loudly. He is the son of the priest of the temple, Zechariah and Elizabeth, a cousin of Jesus, as we hear in Luke, who was born only months before Jesus. And Luke tells us that John left in his mother's womb as Elizabeth greeted the newly pregnant Mary. And today, we meet him fully grown. There's no way we can miss his coming. There's nothing quiet about John's entrance onto the scene. He is not soft or gentle. And he insists on being heard, insists on being listened to. His invitation is a shout as he quotes the prophet Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord. Jeffrey Bromley in his dictionary of the New Testament writes about John. He says, conversion is the core of John's message. 
John Bromley says demands a turning to God as God is turning to us. And Luke tells us John comes proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And the word for repentance used here is the Greek word metanoia, which as Judith Jones tells us in her commentary on today's gospel, is not a mere regret for misdeeds, past misdeeds. It means far more than saying, I'm sorry, and please forgive me. Metanoia means a change of mind and heart, the kind of inner transformation that bears visible fruit. Bromley says that this conversion John calls us to is a once and for all conversion, an inner change that is required of the righteous and must find expression in works of love. Bromley goes on, God grants conversion as both a gift and a task. So what is it about our time and place which echoes Jesus' time and place? Who are the key players and events on our stage? Certainly it is our president and those in authority in our government, government and all of the push and pull that happens there. And the same is true around the world. We are not isolated in this push and pull. We find it in Africa, in Europe, in the Middle East, in Asia. And some of the push and pull is a result of the pandemic. Some, however, is over the unrest and continued conflicts with those in power and those who want to be in power. Issues of women's rights, children, Poverty, Blacks, Indigenous Peoples, Asians, LBGTQ are all a part of it. And of course, there is the climate change, food shortages, supply issues, and the list can go on. And we can find a bit of that push and pull in our own personal lives, and yes, here at our Church of the Holy Spirit. It is exhausting and daunting at times to look at any of them, to let, to let alone all of them all at once as they intertwine and connect us. Who are the John the Baptist today for us who call us to pay attention, call us to transformation, call us to change, repentance, metanoia? Can we change individually, collectively, as communities, as societies, as a whole? Can we change? I thought of those who call us to change. Greta Thunberg, who comes to mind with her call to pay attention to the climate change. She started that at the age of 15. And Malala Yousafzai, who pleads with the world to protect the education of young Muslim girls. And the group of high school youth who stood up for gun control after the Parkland school shooting in Florida. I think of people like Desmond Tutu and his work in South Africa, the Dalai Lama and his work for Tibet, both of whom call us to love one another and to work together. Our own presiding bishop, Michael Curry, in the Way of Love movement, Martin Luther King, who died for his efforts, Rosa Parks, who refused to go back to the back of the bus, and retired Bishop Stephen Charleston, an indigenous people's spokesperson. What does it mean to prepare the way? We are called to be a part of making change happen. We are called to love. So I would like to share a story with you. It's from a movie that I just watched, and it is the Tom Hanks movie, The Fitch. So for those of you who have not seen this movie, this is a big spoiler alert because I'm going to tell you the entire story. But I still suggest that you watch the movie. So I found this to be a story of resilience, a story of conversion, a story of hope, and most of all, a story of love. Finch is a man caught in a time when the world has been radically changed by a solar flare, leaving people in extreme risk, living at odds with one another to the point of killing each other for food 
shelter, and whatever they think they need for survival. And Finch lives alone with a dog, Goodyear, whom he rescued and a small robot he made named Dewey. Finch knows he is dying of radiation poisoning. And he needs to find a way to keep Goodyear, his dog companion, safe after he dies. And not trusting any other humans, he builds himself a robot, an AI, whom he hopes he can train to care for his companion. And the story unfolds with moments of humor as Jeff, because that's the name the AI chose for himself, learns to talk and walk and interact with Finch. And we learn along with Jeff about Finch's own journey. And we see Jeff develop a personality. He is clearly learning more than just what to do and how to act. Because of the increasingly dangerous and difficult weather conditions and lack of a reliable food supply, old scavenged canned goods, as nothing can grow in the burn which in the sun, which burns everything alive. You see Finch at one point standing in the shadows, putting his hand out and getting burned. Plus popping popcorn. So Finch decides to take them to San Francisco overland from St. Louis in a converted rattle trap of an RV. I don't know how it stays together. As Finch clearly becomes sicker, he does not see the humanity growing in Jeff. He does not see that all of his stories about life told through revealing his own personal stories, his conversations that he has with Jeff about trust and how it does and sometimes does not work, is changing Jeff. Jeff is visibly changing in front of us. Jeff learns to drive the mobile home and eventually takes over as Finch moves closer and closer to death. Within 400 miles of San Francisco, Jeff runs into a butterfly with the RV, a monarch butterfly. The world here in this place is still alive. There's hints of green grass growing. They discover that they can leave the RV without protection. And celebrating this incredible time in the sun that is safe together, Finch, Jeff, and Goodyear spend time with a canned food picket, picnic under an umbrella. And then Finch teaches Jeff how to play fetch with Goodyear, one of Goodyear's favorite things to do when he was inside, and now for the first time outside. And Jeff throws the ball, but Goodyear will only bring it back to Finch. Jeff tells Finch that Goodyear does not like him. And Finch has told, told Jeff that Goodyear has to learn to trust Jeff. When tr Jeff wants them to pack up and finish their trip to the Golden Gate Bridge, Jeff tells, sorry, Finch tells Jeff that he is dying. And Jeff then helps Finch get back to the RV. And just before Finch is going to go into the RV, Jeff reaches out from his robotic hand and then he pulls this very surprised Finch into a hug. Their first and last hug. When Jeff dies, when, sorry, Finch dies, Jeff gives him a Viking funeral. Because he'd seen a picture of a Viking funeral. <laughs> he wraps him up and he turns him on fire. And then the movie ends with Jeff and Goodyear at the Gold Gate Bridge, where they find pictures on fences of people who have visited there. Pictures they've left behind with little notes that say, this is where they've gone because this area is safe. 
So Goodyear and Jeff then go off and over the bridge to find them. And the movie ends. How will we be a part of any change that is needed? How will we love? How will we live together in hope and bring light into the darkness? <laughs>